enough. Your grace is enough for me. Come on, let's declare it together. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough for me. Together. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough for me. Your grace is enough. And a bell. grace is enough. Amen. Oh, we have sufficient grace this morning. Jesus paid it all. Amen. Oh, Lord, we come to you. We are worshiping you. We are asking you that your presence will be in this place as we recognize who you are. Oh, Lord, we love you. Sing with us, church. Can we have a little bit more guitar, please? In the house. And I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch him pray. Sustain he watched in one Oh, he watched Lord, now indeed I the leper's hearts and melt the heart of stone. Jesus made it all, all to him I own. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as made it all. Jesus made it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Sin has left. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. He was 
washed it white as snow. He washed it white as snow. Amen. Now we're going to declare something amazing. Oh, praise the one. Are you guys ready? Come on, wake up. Say it with me. Oh, praise the one who paid my day. seated you know the key to understanding that song that Jesus paid it all is recognizing exactly how much we truly owed and that while we were yet sinners God the Father sent his only begotten son into this world to live a sinless life and sacrifice himself on my behalf before I even existed before I even took my first breath and had the opportunity to sin God knew John Spargo is going to be a sinner. And he's going to absolutely blow it when it comes to righteousness. So I'm going to sacrifice my one and only son, the most valuable thing, if we could say it this way, the most valuable thing that God owned, his son. Sacrifice him on the cross for you and for I. Jesus paid it all. Amen. Praise God for his sacrifice on our behalf. Let's have our ushers come if we can at this time to receive our morning offering. There's a couple different ways you can give. Of course, you can give in the offering plate as it comes by. There's also some instructions on the screen for you to give online if you like. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Ask his hand of blessing on our offering. And then if you would still remain seated, I want to direct your attention to our screens. Lord, we thank you. God, for paying our sin debt. Lord, for sacrificing yourself on a cross for us. Lord, as your word says that, you know, maybe for a good person, someone would risk their life. Maybe for a really righteous individual, a person would die. But yet, Lord, we were sinners. Lord, we were wayward. And Lord, you came down for us. Lord, we are so grateful, and God, I don't believe that it's even really possible for us to fully understand what that sacrifice really meant, but Lord, I pray that you'd help us to have a glimpse of it this morning. Lord, as we sing praise to you, God, may we have just a little bit of an understanding of exactly what you did for us on the cross. And Lord, as an expression of our gratitude, God, may we give this morning with grateful hearts, with cheerful hearts, Lord, and may you take what is collected this morning, use it, Lord, use it to those that, Lord, you, Lord, that you still want to see come to know you. Lord, that have not yet placed their faith and their trust in you, God, may we see every heart and soul come to a saving knowledge of your Son. And so, Lord, bless this offering this morning, God. Use it 
In your name we pray. Amen. Deep in the heart of every human is a longing for significance. There is a passion that compels us to make an impact that will live long after we are gone. When it comes to kingdom work, there is no small or big. Spotlights are no more powerful than flashlights. Microphones have the same influence as quiet whispers. Those serving in the shadows have as much a voice as those at center stage. God is never limited by size, personality, or bank accounts. He will use a young child or a grandparent. The meek have as much influence as the bold. He can stretch a dollar farther than we can a bank full of money. He loves to use the small to wow the big. He revels working through the ordinary to proclaim his fame. God invites the poor to give a penny before he ever asks the rich to give a million. God gave of himself so we can give of ourselves. In giving, we release the unseen hand of God's providence. Giving is an expression of our allegiance to an omnipotent king. It invites the great I am into our world and creates places for spiritual milestones. To those who work behind the scenes, your service is forever etched in the hallways of heaven. To those in hospitality, your expressions of kindness invite others to the warmth of God's love. To those who teach, your words bring eternity clearly into focus. To those who give, your generosity paves the way to reaching future generations. Let's go ahead and stand up one more time, guys. And I would ask you to meditate this morning upon what we have said, what we've seen, upon why we are here, why you're here this morning. Would you meditate about that and think? And would you ask the Lord to search your heart? To look inside of you so you can be who he wants you to be. That's ultimately why we are here this morning. Would you sing with us? I'm coming back to the heart of worship. And it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the things I made it. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. And it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the things I made it. When it's all about you, when it's all about you, Jesus. And I simply come Longing just to bring Something that's of worth That will bless your heart I bring you more than a song For a song in itself It's not what you have required you search much deeper within through the way things appear you're looking into my heart Amen. Come on together I'm coming back to the heart of 
worship and it's all about you it's all about you Jesus I'm sorry Lord for things I've made it when it's all about you when it's all about you I'm coming back I'm coming back to It's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for things I've made. And it's all about you. It's all about you. And it's all about you. It's all about you. And it's all about you, and it's all about you, Jesus. And it's all about you, Jesus. Amen. I'm coming back. Would you say that with me one time? I'm coming back to the heart of worship. It's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the things I made it. And it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. Right. I hope you believe that this morning. It is all about Jesus. He is the heart of worship. I'm glad that you've chosen to be here with us this morning and this beautiful weekend, and we rejoice in what God is doing. I enjoyed, how many of y'all enjoyed this weekend, the sunshine a little bit, some blue sky? Oh, man. My wife, um, she convinced me to have a garage sale. And uh, thanks, Ish. And I was opposed to this because who wants to have a garage sale, right? And and uh, she finally talked me into it, and 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 we started hauling stuff out of our basements and putting it out in the yard. And I thought, boy, this is painful, right? But it was a beautiful weekend for a garage sale. Let's just say that. And then, and then the Lord sent one special person to our garage sale yesterday. And this woman walked in and said, I want everything on that table and that table and that table. And if I was here yesterday, you wouldn't need to be open today. And I tickled inside. <laughs> and I said, okay, I'm so glad you came here today. And uh, we began to talk. It was wonderful. We um, found out she, was a, she used to come to First Bible years ago. Um, and she's been to a couple different churches. She may come here this morning. And uh, yard sales turn out to be a great place to talk to people about Jesus. So it worked out good. First, let's see, where are we? James chapter 4 is where we are. I'd love for you to stand with me as we read through these verses. We're going to start in verse 6. We've been going through the book of James. And uh, we're going to continue going through the book of James. Verse 6 is where we ended last week, if you uh, are paying attention. We are going to start there this week because it really adds an interesting bookend from verse 6 to verse 10. There's this discussion on humility, which I think the Bible thinks is uh, pretty important. So let's go ahead and read from verse 6. He says, James, speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in verse 6, but he giveth more grace. Wherefore, he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted, and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to heaviness. Verse 10, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we are grateful that we can... Uh, come here this morning. Father, thank you for the heart of worship. Thank you that 
uh, we can give of our tithes and our offerings. Thank you that we can come and we can fellowship with the brethren in freedom and liberty. Thank you that we can lift up our voice to you, and now that we can receive of your word. Lord, I pray we would with all readiness of mind that it would transform us and it would conform us to be more like you. God, that we on earth would resemble our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we pray for your presence in this place. We pray for your spirit to speak into our hearts and into each one of our lives. Uh, Lord, we have just read your word. This is your truth. And God, we ask now that you would uh, uh, just expose it for what it is, Lord. Allow us to understand it in depth. For we pray and ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Drawing near to God is the title of the message here today. And we're going to look at five steps uh, in how to draw near and how to walk closer to God. And I hope that you will choose after this message is over to take that walk with me, to take those steps in order to be nearer to God. I believe humility is the crown of the Christian life. Yes, we should be a people that are loving. Yes, we should be gracious and compassionate and generous and purposed. Yet when I think of the Christian walk, I, I tend to think of two main things. I think of holiness and I think of humility. And so James is going to take us, if you will, to the jeweler today that we may get our crown fitted, that we may be adorned in humility. In the text, we see this verse in 6. Uh, we see this word humility in verse 6, and again, we see it in verse 10. And everything that's in between there is going to help us to come to that place of humility. For in verse 10, he tells us when we are truly humbled, humbled that is when God is going to lift us up. And so we are attempting maybe the greatest feat of man today. We're not looking for the cure of cancer. We're not looking to win a political race. We're not looking to land a man on the moon. We're not looking to become the next Renoir or Mozart. We are looking to go way beyond human accomplishment and enter the realm of the divine. See, we're not pursuing accomplishment. What we are pursuing is God's literal and manifest presence in our life. We can, do, we can do that. That's what the Bible is talking about here, that we, as His creation, can literally come into and enjoy His presence. One of the greatest feelings I have as a dad is when I come home uh, at night or wherever it may be, and I walk, in the, I walk in and I open up that door, and my kids look over and they see me, they shout, Dad's home! And they come running over, and they give, me, they give me a snuggle, right? And then there's other times that I open up the door, I stomp loudly, right? And they're all in a TV trance. I don't know if you know what a TV trance is. Now, I know most of you think that pastor's kids are probably just home memorizing Scripture or on their knees praying to God. But sometimes my kids fall into the TV trance, and, and, and I kind of think to myself, well, hey, I'm over here, I'm over here, right? And we all want to have that nearness to those that we love. You know, God is the same way. He wants us to be near to Him. And oftentimes there can be walls in our life. There can be a distance. The truth is God does not move. He does not drift away. God does not change. Therefore, if our relationship with God is different or is less or is weakened, it makes sense that it's because we have drifted away from God and not that God has lost interest in me. If you've ever been to the ocean and you're out there playing in the water and you maybe lose track of time and you're just swimming or you're treading water maybe and the tide begins to go out, you may realize, man, I'm not in the same spot I, am, I once was. I, I mean, the shore hasn't moved. It's just me that's drifted away from there. There are many good reasons why a, a person can drift away. Maybe good is not the right word here, but there's many reasons that people drift Kids that graduate high school and enter college, they were used to some kind of parental supervision and weekly church attendance, and now they go off to college and they don't have a parent saying, hey, are you coming to church? Or, hey, let's go to church. We're going to church, right? And so there's this drift that begins to take away. It's common for college Christians to feel that sense of distance. I'm not where I once was because I'm not doing the, the Christian things. We can see newly marrieds that 
have drifted away from the Lord. Two people, they have all the common interests. They both confess a relationship with the Lord, and uh, now they're married, children are starting to come, and work is busy, life is a challenge. Drift begins to naturally take place. It seems easy as that young married couple with children to take a Sunday off. It seems easy to, to, to go to a travel soccer game instead of go to church. It's something I wouldn't have done 10 years ago. It's something that I would, never would have thought about, but now all of a sudden I feel this drift, this distance that is taking place in my life. We can see it with seasoned marriages even. The kids are out of college, they're out of the house, they're getting married off, they're starting their own families. The marriage that you have has more time than ever, you have more disposable income than ever. It can be easy sometimes to see church as something that I needed to do for my children. But for me, I don't need it as much as if a personal relationship is only necessary for the little ones, but not necessary for me and my spouse in life. Drift can take, it, take place. We can see it with, with sunset Christians, right? Those that are nearing the end of their race. They're tired. They have given. They've gone. They've raised their kids. They may have grandchildren at this point. They may even begin to see great-grandchildren. They have done their part in life. It can be easy for all of us for them to focus less on the kingdom work. It's not in, that we've intentionally taken these steps away. It's just that the tide has gone out and we haven't realized it and we're further and further away from God. There's a distance that has occurred. James says to all of us, no matter what season of life that we are in, that we need to draw near to God and when we draw near to God, He will draw near to us. I love this verse, verse 8. I, I, I would ask that you would memorize it, that you would underline it, that you would highlight it in your Bible, that you would talk to your children, you would talk to your friends. You'd shout it to the devil and say, listen, God has told me that if I would draw near to Him, that He would draw near to me. So we're going to learn of five distinct ways for us to fight against that tide, for us to take some steps to narrow the drift now, God's narrow path of humility is oftentimes punctured with many well-intentioned but failed exercises. For some of this, the path of humility looks like religion, it looks like integrity, it looks like morality. If I just attend church more, if we just don't do anything illegal, if I, if I, if I just show up for work on time, if I just don't cheat on an exam or steal from my neighbor, then I must be on God's right path of goodness. But that's just not the case. God wants us to be a people that are truly humble before Him. So we see in verse 6 of this text that He giveth more grace, and this is where it always starts in the Scripture. This grace is a gift to the humble, and we spoke about this a little bit last week. To those that submit themselves to our Lord, to those that can humble ourselves and say, God, I have sinned before you. God, I'm living in darkness. God, my life is not what it needs to be. I submit to you, God, that I need your help. That's an act of humility. The Bible tells us in Ephesians 2, 4, by grace are you saved through faith. It's not me that does the saving, but it's God's gift that He pours out to those that will humble themselves before the hand of the Almighty and recognize that the cross, the despicable cross where the blood of the Lamb was shed is the only way that we can find salvation and purpose in this life. We are told that that reception of grace, it's not a one-time reception, but we continue to receive that grace in order that when we walk in humility, God pours out His grace. He pours out His blessing and His favor. We talked last week that He would prosper us and make us successful. And there are times, as this text tells us, that He will resist the proud. He gives grace to the humble, but He resists the proud. You say, why would God ever resist me? Why does God want to keep me from the very best? Because there are times in every single one of our lives that we begin to veer off and go down a wrong path, and God in His loving kindness is going to correct us to bring us back to a narrow path, a path where we recognize our need for Him every day. 
not just on Sunday mornings, but at work, in my marriage, with my children, no matter what I'm doing, I come to the place where I need you, Lord. Every moment of the day, God, I need you. So we start in verse 7 with these five steps, if you will, to get nearer to God. And so in verse 7, he tells us that we are to submit ourselves, therefore, to God. So it's us that's submitting. We are obeying God. This is not out of coercion, if you will, but out of love and out of passion for Jesus and His way. This is where it starts. If we're going to draw near to God, if we're going to receive that humility and that favor and the benefit of God, then we are the ones that must submit ourselves to God. To submit is to recognize the lordship and the authority of another. And obviously in this text, we're recognizing that authority of Jesus in our life. Doing God's will is an act of submission. Submission is seen all throughout the Scripture, all throughout it. By the way, it's, it's common sense, right? We submit to the laws of the road. We, we submit to the, to, the, to the precepts of our dentists. We sit, submit to the, to the vows of our, of our marriages. And, and this submi- submission, it keeps us from excess speed on the road, right? We don't get a ticket from going too fast. But it also allows us to live, right? It keeps us from endangering ourselves by going too fast. We look at the dentist, the dentist says, says uh, hey, you need to eat less sugary things, and so we cut some sugars out, maybe, right? A- and that elongates the value of our, of our teeth. We, we take marriage vows, and what we're doing is we're putting up parameters in our marriage And you could say, well, these parameters are not healthy. I I want to live in absolute liberty. Well, when we live in absolute liberty, we drive 100 miles an hour down Manitow Road, or we eat all the sugars we want, or we do whatever we want in our marriage. It's not healthy. It's dangerous. So we are to submit. Submission is common sense. But for some reason, when we say to God, when God says to us, I want you to submit to my will and my way, we go, oh, God, I just don't want to do that. Listen, God has our best interest in mind. So when we submit to Him, we are going to benefit. 1 Samuel chapter 15, I love what the the old prophet says. Samuel said to Saul, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? You know what he says here? Your sacrifice, your giving... All the treasures that you pile up, all the fatted calves that you give, all the service you do for me, I mean, that's just not what I'm asking for. Obeying the voice of the Lord, he goes on to say, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken or to hear than that of the fatted fat rams. I, I, I have these, I have children, and... and uh, they're a blessing most of the time because I have children, right? They're, they're not perfect children. I'm trying to train my children, and there's things that I'm, I would like them to do. You know, the, there, there's things that I've asked them to do, and there's days that I literally have to ask them over and over to do this. And then there's days that I walk past their room and go, Savannah, did you clean the kid's room for them? No, they just did it all by themselves. And you go, this is amazing. Uh, You know, they come home and they begin to do their homework without coercion or force or bribes, right? And and you begin to think, this is, you know, this is exactly what the Lord is teaching us right here. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. See, God wants us to obey Him, to hear His voice, to understand Him and follow His ways. Jeremiah chapter 7, the prophet says, But to this thing commanded I them, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and ye shall be my people. And walk ye in all the ways that I have commanded you, and then look at this, that it may be well unto you. Do you see the correlation? Obeying God and the wellness of your life, walk hand in hand. When we obey, when we hearken, God says, I will be with you. See, it's not always easy to submit. Abraham was challenged with this. He was asked to sacrifice his son. He had to make that to choice. God, do you really know what you're doing? Do I really believe you? 
I can hear your voice, but I'm not sure that I can obey you. Jesus was uh, 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 brought to this place as well. God, I know what your plan is, redemption of all mankind and the, and the defeat of the devil. But God, to do that, I have to be willing to lay down. I have to be willing to sacrifice. God, I have to be willing to obey. That's what decision every one of us has to make. Submission to God through the Scripture. I've put up a, a list of different things that we all need to submit to, and this list could go on and on. The Bible tells us we need to be saved is the, is the first thing that I, I put up on the screen. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, the Bible says that, that, he, that he wants all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Listen, if you're here today and you're not sure how to obey God, the very first thing that you need to do is to obey God and the leading of the Spirit of God that you would submit your life to Him and receive forgiveness of sin. That's what God wants for you. Some of you, you come here week in and week out, and you still don't know if you were to die today where you would spend eternity. God wants you to know that answer. And if you would obey Him, He would give you resolution in your soul. Secondly, He wants us to be baptized. Matthew 28, verse 19, one of the things we're to do is to go into all the world and to, and to be baptized. You say, well, why do I need to be baptized? It is an outward demonstration. You are declaring to your friends and your family and your neighbors, I am a follower of Jesus Christ and I am not ashamed of that. If you've never been baptized, you know what the Bible says? Obey me. Follow my ways. Do this. Thirdly, uh, and these are just random, they're not in any order, we are to be a people that praise the Lord, that we worship God. Psalms chapter 95, he tells us to come together, let us worship him, let us bow down before him, let us kneel before the God, our God, the, our maker. We are to be a people, and one of the things we do in this church is we come together to congregationally lift up our voices and praise the living God. Sometimes I look around and I see I see, I see mannequins. And I go, man, what's happening? Why don't you want to sing? Well, I don't like to sing. Listen, I have a terrible, I, I stand over here and every now and then I'll be singing and the person next to me looks over and goes like this. You know what Aaron said? We were to come together and make a joyful, underline it, noise, okay? And many of you say, I don't like to sing, I have a terrible voice. Man, it's a noise, okay? It's these people that are all jacked up. They're not making a noise. It's us. We're to praise God. We're to make a joyful noise together. The next one would be generosity. God loves a cheerful giver. You know how we can obey the Scripture? You know how we can obey God? By being generous towards the kingdom of God, by being generous towards His church. Evangelism, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul said, woe is me. Woe is me if I don't preach the gospel, if I don't tell people about His saving grace and His amazing love that has transformed my life. To be obedient to God is to be obedient to the Scripture, and it's to tell people we're to have fellowship, Acts chapter 2 we're to come together. It's not to just arrive at, at uh, 8.35, come in, listen, and leave at 10.01, but we are to actually come in, and, and we are to have fellowship. We are to lock arms with each other, the body of Christ. 2 Timothy chapter 2 tells us that we are to be disciples. We're to invest one in another, not just a transference of knowledge, but of, our, uh, of the way of life. How do you be a Christian and work in corporate America? How do you be a Christian and walk through a secular university? How do you be a Christian and, and, and play sports? How do you be a Christian and be a police officer, or an electrician? Man, I've struggled with that. How do I do that? You know, there's people in this church that can walk with you. That's called discipleship. Psalm 100 verse 2 talks about serving the Lord with gladness using our gifts and our talents for the kingdom of God and for His church. Matthew chapter 28 talks about the mission to go into this world, to love God, to love people, to serve others, and to tell everyone. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 talks about prayer. You know, we obey God by praying to God. 
Every believer is supposed to have a prayer life in which we commune, in which we communicate, in which we connect with God. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 talks about charity, meaning this is not just the chapter we read when people get married, but this is the chapter we live. Charity. Go through that today, this afternoon, and understand how it is that we are to obey God in charity. Matthew chapter 22, verse 39 tells us that we are to love our neighbor. This is, again, these are not godly suggestions. These are things that God is telling us to obey Him with. And if we are going to draw near to God, then we need to be a, a, a people that submit to God, that obey Him, that, that don't look at these and go, oh man, do I really need to do that? Oh God, do I, do, is that really in the Bible? These are things that God wants us to look and go, man, I'm so happy to praise and to worship and to fellowship and to serve and to use and to give and to pray and to honor Him with my life and to tell other peoples what a blessing that is. See, there's no middle ground on all of this. There's no such thing as submission to Jesus Christ as Savior, but not submitting to Him as our Lord. Every time we submit to something the Scripture clearly speaks to us about, it is a step nearer to God. You say, man, I struggle with praying. Well, just set your alarm a little bit, a little bit earlier, five minutes maybe tomorrow or ten minutes the next day or whatever it may be. You know what that is? That's a step towards God. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm just not good at giving. I have a hard time with that. Well, you know what? Just start with a little. Just start, you know what? I don't know if I, where I can serve. Just come to us. We'll help you. I, I just don't know if I can give him my time. Just, just, just start with a little. You know what it's called? It's called a step in the right direction. We're starting, to, we're starting to swim against the tide. We're starting to draw near to God when we do these things. We see, secondly, that we are to resist the devil. Resist the devil. So we submit to God, and then we resist the devil. Here is the dark truth about the Bible and about life. There is an enemy. There is a bad guy. There is an evil. There is an adversary. I personally don't speak much about the devil because I don't want to give him undue credit in my life, but there is a wicked, wicked, evil force whose sole purpose is to kill and to destroy us. And he exists not to just puncture our tires but to bring shame and ruin and hurt and despair and depression and to confusion into our lives. He doesn't show up with a little red hoodie and a pitchfork with a little, little subtle smoke coming out of his tail. He is more subtle than any beast of the field, and he's looking to destroy our lives. And you know what James says right here? Resist this chump. We're to resist him. So to stand with the Lord means we stand against everything sinful and worldly that was formerly uh, uh, appealing and corrupting and, and enslaving, okay? Listen, this is not about setting up charms in your house. This is not about calling a pastor to wave some holy smoke or to uh, some holy water around. Or This is not about putting a, a cross around your neck. This is not about putting a Bible next to the table uh, uh, by your bed, this is about drawing near to God, and to draw near to God, we resist the devil. Ephesians chapter 6 says we do that when we put on the armor of God. When we live in faith before Him, we're able to resist Him. We resist the devil in practice by fleeing from temptations. And when we flee from sin, the devil, as this text tells us, will flee from us. See, this happened in Jesus' day. Jesus fasted 40 days, and the Bible says the, the devil came to him, and he tempted him. And, 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 and this wasn't little pieces of candy, you know, to a little child. These were, this is big-time stuff. And every time that the devil tempted Jesus, Jesus resisted him. And after three times of resisting him, you know what the devil did? Fled. 
he left him alone. That's what happens in our lives if we would do the same thing. Maybe the greatest temptation the devil has put before us is to believe there is no devil. In 1 Peter chapter 5, in verse 8, he says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may. He's going to give the chomp down. He wants to devour us. This isn't flat tires. Oh, I'm late to work. The devil's at it again. He wants to devour me and destroy me. Look what verse 9 says. Did I put up there verse 9? Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. You know what it doesn't say? It doesn't say, ignore, pretend that he doesn't exist. But he says, resist this guy in the faith. How do we resist the devil? See, to resist means we oppose or we fight back or we stand against his vices. And oftentimes his vices are temptations that he lures us, that he, that he carrots us with, that he tries to bring before us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, it tells us that we are to flee fornication. The Bible tells us every sin that a man doth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. So if we want to resist the devil, we need to flee fornication. Now, I get this. This, this is not super trendy right now. Casual sex is on the rise. Did you know that in a 2018 survey, 70% of Americans raised their hand and says it's morally acceptable to have sex outside of marriage or before marriage. That's the culture we live in. It's very common in our universities and in our workplaces for people to shack up and think there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. See, that's the devil, and we are to be a people that resist that. 64% of young people ages 13 to 24 seek pornographic images and videos on a weekly or more basis. Ages 13 to 24, 65% of those people. You say flee fornication. Listen, the word fornication is an umbrella term that, that, that has to do with pornography. It has to do with casual sex. It's, it's everything in there. If you're involved in that, you can't draw near to God. You can't. But if you want to resist the devil put those things away, and you take a step towards Him. Secondly, He tells us that we are to flee idolatry. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, He says, simply flee idolatry. It is super easy. Idolatry is that, is that term God uses to say, anything that you allow before me. Now, in the old days, we look at idolatry as if we've set up a Buddha in our home. We walk into somebody's home with a Buddha and go, man, that's idolatrous. That's terrible. We shouldn't be a part of that. Okay, that's true, but idolatry is setting up anything before God. Did you know that your family can become idolatrous? Did you know that you can put your family before God? Did you know that you can put your career before God? I'm just working 60, 70 hours. I'm doing this for the good of my family. I'm doing this because God's given me these talents. And all the while, you're ignoring God, not doing the things that He has called us to do. Athletics can be idolatry in our life. Arts, music, anything can become idolatrous when we take it and we put it before Him. And He says, listen, put away idolatry. Flee from it. It's a temptation that every one of us is going to be challenged with. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, in verse 10, He says, flee the love of money. He tells us the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some have coveted after, they have erred from the faith. So you know what we need to do? We need to flee from the love of money, believing that riches, that wealth at any cost is the end game. It's the most important thing that can happen in my life. As long as I am wealthy, then therefore I am successful. God says no. Pursue God's kingdom. Don't pursue the love of money. 
Fourthly, we see that we are to, perf- we are to flee youthful lust. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22, these, this, he specifically addresses this teenage sensuality, this improper touching that takes place in our young people, this fixation of improper love, that goofy love. Have you ever seen, you know what I'm talking about, right? When two people in, in the eighth grade or the ninth grade, they, they just, they keep looking at each other and there's that goofy exchange of notes and text messages and those, and those, I love you so much. And then a week later, what happened? Oh, I can't stand that person, right? <laughs> what, what do you mean? Where'd we go, right? He says, hey, flee youthful lust. If we want to resist the devil, then we have to do things God's way. See, the devil des- desires to destroy and to kill. He, destroy, he wants to corrupt us and to put us in his bondage. He can never take away our eternal salvation. But he can hinder us. He can shame us. He can hurt us. He can fracture us. And God says, I don't want that for you. If you would draw near to me, if you would resist the devil, then I will lift you up. So you must have that, that, that fortitude and that faith and that vision to resist. For the God that is in us is greater than the evil that is without us. And if we would come to understand that, then we are resisting in the power of God's Spirit, not in our own flesh. I get resisting is not always easy. I, 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 I mean, there's, there's challenges all around us to be, you know, to buy and to be this and to look at this and to be attracted to this and to do these things. It, you know, it's a dumb illustration, but if you've ever tried to be on a diet, you've said to yourself, okay, I'm not going to eat that. And so when you walk through the kitchen, that calls your name, doesn't it? That says to you, I'm over here, right? And, and, you, and you think to yourself, ah, I don't want that. I know that I'm trying to get ready for, you know, my beach body, and I don't want, you know, and I, I know this is going to, uh, uh, one chocolate chip cookie can't be that bad, right? <laughs> it's hard to resist. I know people that struggle with social media. Got to be on Instagram. Got to be on Pinterest. Got to be throwing Snapchats around. You got to be on Facebook, whatever it is. And so every time you sit down, that stupid app just seems to be yelling at you. I'm here. We're buddies, remember? Okay, I'll just look for a minute, right? A minute turns into 10. 10 turns into an hour. Next thing you know, you're in your bed, flipping through one last time, making sure I'm updated. I can't resist. And it's so difficult sometimes. But as you begin to push away from that, it becomes easier and easier and easier. Listen, I don't don't know about you, but when I'm looking to keep the devil away, as far away from me and my family as I possibly can. And when I do resist, the devil will actually flee from me because what's happening is when I resist the devil, I'm taking a step towards God. You know where the devil wants to be? not near God. So every time I resist the devil, I'm going nearer to God, and the devil's going, I'm not going in the same direction you are. Good. We'll see you later there, guy. I don't want to be near you. You don't want to be near me. Let's just make this agreement not to walk together ever again, okay? We see, again, he tells us to draw near to God in verse 8. This draw near to God is, is fellowship with God. He tells us in Malachi 3, even from the days of your fathers, ye are gone away from mine ordinances, have not kept them. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. It's not an anomaly. God's people have always struggled with drift, with the tide pulling them out, with just trying to tread water. It doesn't work. It didn't work for Israel. It didn't work for the early church. It hasn't worked in my life, and it probably hasn't worked in your life. We can't just tread water and think that we're going to draw near to God. He says in Jeremiah 29, And you shall seek me and find me when you shall search me with all of your heart. 
when we pursue him with, with true passion, with true intense intensity, we will come to that place where we find him, where we desire to worship, to meet, to seek his help, to gain assurance, and to follow his ways. See, this drawing near is necessary because we have often allowed these roadblocks, these walls to come in that, that hinder and many things seem important and, and closer to our heart than worship and prayer and Scripture and meditation. And so God is saying, listen, we need to put those things away so that we can have fellowship with God. See, um, I've, got this, I've got this dog in my house. And when I sit on the couch, this dog jumps up on my lap. And, and if, it was, if he just did that, everything would be fine. But he doesn't do that, right? My hand sits there, and he takes his little nose, and he puts it under his hand, and he makes me pet him, right? It's like this involuntary petting that's going on. And if I pull my hand away, he gets back under, and he does this thing, right? He just wants to be so close. When I sit down, and I'm thinking, the dog's not here, I hear him run through the house, jump on top of me, wants to be near. Sometimes my wife, because the dog is on top of me, she sits in a different chair altogether. Now, the reality is, even though my wife is 10 feet away from her, from me, she's still closer than that dog will ever be because that dog is just a dog. For many of us, we've allowed things to jump on our lap that keep us from fellowship with the most important things in our life. And when I say to my wife, why don't you sit on the couch? She's like, I don't want to be in competition with the dog. You know what I need to do sometimes? I need to get that dog off the couch. I need, to, I need to get some things out of my life is what I'm trying to say so that I can come back in fellowship with God. We may say, oh God, if you're out there, please reveal yourself. Come and show yourself to me. And all the while, the Lord is saying, I'm right here and I've always been right here. If you would take a step towards me, you would feel my presence. You would know me. See, drawing near is fellowship with the heart of God. It's, it's that recognizing His plan, His love, His will, His way, and choosing that course. Man, if you're in high school, draw near to God. If you're at a university, draw near to God. If you're in marriage, draw, if you're single, draw, there's never a time that we shouldn't be drawing near to God. We are always to be a people that are seeking first His kingdom. We're told that we're to cleanse our hands in verse 8, and purify our hearts. The hands represent the external, obviously, and the hearts, and our heart represents the, the internal. He tells us that, that we need to cleanse these, he, you double-minded, those people that are lacking integrity, if you will. He says, we need to clean, clean all of this up. And David says in Psalms 24, who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in His holy place? He that has clean hands and a pure heart, who's not lifted up his soul unto vanity nor sworn de deceitfully, he shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Man, I want the blessings of God. You know what he says? Clean your hands. Purify your hearts. It's our hands that, that get soiled, that, that touch too much of the filth of this world, that get too involved. Before we know it, we're embracing and we're walking in the way of sinners and we're, we're filthy. Before long, our hearts are impacted. We're watching shows that are full of murder, full of greed, full of pride and revenge. We're reading books that are full of lust and anger. We're searching the internet for more of what it is, whatever it is more and more and more. We feel a dullness to the Lord. We lack the clarity because that, that film of dirt is on our heart and on our body. And he tells us in Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 4, O Jerusalem, wash thine heart from wickedness that thou mayest be saved. First John tells us if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. See, God desires that we walk in purity. I'm not going to give you a list of things here today that defile your hands. I'm not going to give you a list of things that, that corrupt your heart. You're, you're, you're big enough here to know when you start touching something, it makes you dirty. He says, come back to God. 
Cleanse yourself of all these things. And listen, don't think for a second that God has some sort of low immune system that he can't handle my germs and bacteria. It's not that God is up in heaven going, I'm fragile, and if, and if dirty Kevin shows up, that he's going to corrupt everything. Keep him away. No, no. God is light, and in him is no darkness. So when I'm dirty and I start to come to God, you know what that light does? It reveals my darkness. And so instead of coming near to God, my filth shows itself, and I say to myself, man, I think I'd better go in the other direction. So God, He's trying to reveal Himself. He's trying to say, purify yourselves, you people, and when you truly purify yourselves, you'll want to come into, our, into my presence. Lastly, the last step here to come to God is to be afflicted, to mourn, and to weep. If we're going to draw near to God, it's not going to be this casual drive-through, place our order, have it done in five minutes. He's saying, man, if you really want to draw near to God, there's going to need to be some affliction. There's going to need to be the, the man, I messed up. I messed up so much that I'm willing to cry about it. I feel this sense of contrition. You know, you know, sometimes what we do as parents, we kind of mow things over for our children. We take out, we take as many problems away from them. It, 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 you know, we, we, we want them to be in the Olympics. We want them to be on the cover of a magazine. We want them to have academic, uh, you know, uh, we want Yale and Brown and Harvard, all of them to give them scholarships. And when they don't get all those things, we mow it over and go, oh, no, it's going to be all right. Everything's going to be okay. You know what? Sometimes our kids are lazy. Sometimes our kids don't work as hard as they should. Sometimes our kids just aren't equipped or gifted to be those people. That's okay. We don't need to mow everything over. Sometimes our kids do wrong, and they need to go and cry about it a little bit. And by the way, sometimes I do wrong too, and I don't always need somebody to walk up to me and say, oh, it's going to be okay. Sometimes I just need to get a good cry out and recognize I messed up, but God still loves me. Be afflicted, mourn, and weep. All too often we laugh at the wrong things. I, I, I mean, it's called a funny bone for a reason, right? You ever, you ever hit the funny bone? It's not you that it's funny to. It's funny to everybody else when they do the funny bone dance, okay? I, I was at a party once, and... <laughs> I'm debating whether I should tell this story right now. I, I, met a, I was at a party once, and, and, and there was this, the pool was out there. We were inside the house, and the, and the door, the glass door was closed. And this bro, we were talking to this guy, and this bro, and he did one of these things, and he hit this window, this door, full on. And he hit it so hard that, that his face hit it, his whole body hit it at the exact same time, and he literally went straight back. I could hardly contain myself. Immediately, we walked over and said, man, are you okay? We grabbed some ice, put it on him, set him down, and said, man, I hope you're okay. And then my friend and I, we walked out of the house and went, <laughs> it was hysterical. Now, you ain't laughing, but I don't know why you're not laughing, because you all do the same exact thing, okay? <laughs> it's not wrong to laugh. It's not, God's not saying, man, you should never laugh in this world, I mean, God is, he is comedic in many ways. Have you ever looked at a wiener dog? I mean, he allowed that to take place. Have you ever looked at a poodle? I mean, that's amazing. God, what are you doing right now? We could talk about puberty if we wanted, right? I love that time where the squeaky voice and the pimples come out. That's just beautiful, God. He's just looking down there going, oh. What about Zumba pants? You remember those? Oh, I love those. Belt buckle. If you've ever been down in the south, man, the belt buckle. This is God just up there going, oh, I love humanity. This is amazing. It's not wrong to laugh. But there are times that we need to be sobered, that we do wrong, and we don't need to hide that. We need to come before God on our knees and say, God, I messed it up. 
Ecclesiastes 3 says that there's a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance. Jesus said in Luke 6, Blessed are ye that hunger now, for ye shall be filled. Blessed are ye that weep now. Weep now, he says, and ye shall laugh. It's okay to have a little bit of sorrow from life here and there. Verse 10, and this is where we finish. We are to humble ourselves back to this bookend, right? Rec- recognizing my position in, in the sight of the Lord. And when that haps- happens, Scripture tells us that God is going to lift us up. When we're lifted up, it's not our strength, but His strength that He builds us, that we find His favor. See, God has always honored those that are spiritually humble. And the crown jewel for a Christian is humility. It's not position, it's not rewards, it's not occupation, it's not family accomplishments, it's not the legacy I leave behind. It is my humility that matters before God. And so what I'm asking you to do today is I'm asking you to search your own heart. I'm asking you to look and to see, have you drifted away from God? I want you to listen to your own conversations. Are are you full of gossip? I want you to look through your own eyes. Are you full of lust and greed and pride? I want you to examine your life. Have you just been treading water and as you look to the to the to the shoreline you realized, man, you're getting pretty far away from safety. You know what you need to do today? You need to draw near to God. You need to take some intentional steps to come back to Him. Draw near to Him, and He will draw near to you. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful for this morning, for this text. God, help us to be a people that are not at distance with You, but we have nearness, we have Your presence, we have Your abiding love and Your grace and Your hope. God, do Your work in our lives. I pray Your Spirit would speak, God, and, and, and all of us would respond that we would be nearer today than we were yesterday. Bless us now. Do your work, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand with me as we sing this invitation song. As Aaron, as the praise team, sings, Lord, I need you. Do you need the Lord today? Do you need Him in your life? Would you please draw near to Him, whether you're in your seat or whether you come to this altar? Make a step. Take a step to come into the presence of of our God. Aaron, would you lead us? I come, I confess, now in here I find my rest. Without you I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart.
so touch my soul to rise to you when temptation comes my way and when I cannot stand I fall on you cause Jesus you're my hope and stay when I cannot stand and when I cannot stand, I fall on you. Cause Jesus, you're my hope and stay. My name is Therese. And my name is Ashley. I hope you were encouraged today through the worship and the message. We just want to tell you about a few events coming your way. We are really excited about our food truck trio this coming Wednesday. You can visit our food trucks from 5.30 to 6.30 at the north end of the church. You'll want cash for the trucks, lawn chairs to relax on, and outdoor games for some fun. The three trucks you can choose from are the locally famous Macarolling, and for summer vibes, Humpty's Hops. And for the more health conscious, we have Wraps on Wheels. At 7 o'clock, we will gather in the sanctuary for an abbreviated and practical family service, followed by free Duke's Donuts at 8 o'clock near the north entrance of the building. You can grab a $1 coupon for each of your family members at the North Welcome Center today only. We can't wait to see you at the Food Truck Trio. We're planning a great evening for all of our married couples on Sunday, June 23rd at the Grace and Truth Sports Park. This cookout will also have plenty of games that will provide a good laugh. The park opens at 4 and will eat at 5.30. The church is providing hot dogs, hamburgers, and the drinks. Sign up on the events tab of our church website and bring a dish to pass. It'd be amazing if you could stay in touch with us this week on social media. We're on Facebook and Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. And visit our website for past messages and all event details. Thanks for spending some of your Sunday with us. If you're a guest, stop by our New Here kiosk for a gift especially for you. Have a great Sunday. A school where self-discipline is expected. A school where Bible truth is taught. A school where Christian character is emphasized. A school where morality is stressed. A school where academic achievement is honored. A school for you. Hi, my name is Ryan Gray. Here at North Star Christian Academy, we offer pre-K to 12th grade, Bible-based, Christ-centered, complete education. We offer traditional course offerings from a biblical worldview. We promote excellence, and strive to encourage students to be more like Christ while preparing them for the real world. We would love to see how North Star can best serve you and your family. North Star Christian Academy is a ministry of this church, if you're not familiar with it. We have between 270 and 320 children that are at that school every year. Three of my children will be there in the fall. If you're interested in Christian education or what that even means, 
Ryan Grape over here, he'll be in the foyer, would love to talk to you. He'd love to give you a tour of the school, help you understand more about what that looks like. Uh, this Wednesday's Pathway Series should be fantastic. If you're just not sure, well, come and try it out and find out for sure. We'd love for you to be a part of it. Let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Father, thank you for this day. God, I want to draw near to you. Would you help me to do that this day and this week? Help me to take these five intentional steps. Lord, would your favor be upon this people? And may every one of us make an intentional decision to follow and to pursue and to seek you this day. We ask for your help. We ask to be successful in what you've called us to do. We pray all of this now in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here. We hope to see you back Wednesday evening at 530.